I had people coming into my art show booth, seeing my river table, and they'd start talking about their memories of like fishing with their dad or stuff like that. And it was it was kind of like uh, got emotional for these people. Yeah. I even had someone in my art show booth start crying as they told me a story. And uh, it was all brought on by my work. Like, who's going to cry over a dining table? But it's it's the emotion and the memory that it taps into that makes it such a neat moment. Leo here, your host of the Building Bellion podcast, and thanks for stopping by the studio. Pour a glass of whiskey or local beer, take a sip, kick those feet up. We're going to dive into what it means to be a business owner, what it means to be a member of this Bellingham and Whatcom County community, and what it means to find peace and balance while running a badass, high-octane, local, iconic business. Let's jump in. Greg Clausen here in the studio. Yeah. Thanks for joining me. Where did you just come from? What were you just doing? Uh, since I got out to the wood shop this morning up until about an hour ago, I had a dust mask on and I was sanding wood for some new artwork in my shop all day long. What so. kind of what kind of uh, mask did you have on? Uh, full face. It's this really cool one. Of course, I think masks are cool because it's part of my life, but it's got like the shield and the respirator. So yeah. the whole thing, you're all protected. All protected. All Nothing's protected. getting in. No. All, only out. Only out and uh, you got your headphones on, you got your podcast going. So Nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah. My name is Greg Clausen, as you already said, and I'm a husband. I'm a father. I always start there. And I'm also an artist and a woodworker. I create my own designs in both furniture and wall hung art and now recently sculpture. And um, I have customers all around the world. I've shipped to all sorts of crazy places that are hard to hard to pronounce even. And sometimes you deliver. And sometimes I deliver. Last weekend, I drove all the way out to uh, Sun Valley, Idaho and back in three days, 750 miles each way, yeah. delivered my work to a customer who calls his, his house the uh, Greg Clausen Museum. So good customer. Good customer. To have. How tall was that piece? How much did it weigh? Uh, it was 12 and a half feet tall and it weighed probably around 2000 pounds. I'm guessing I don't have a scale. Yeah. My scale kind of tops out at 200 pounds. You tried lifting it and you're like probably 2000. Yeah. Based yeah. on the amount of pain and discomfort I had from the test lift. <laughs> I just estimated manpower needed. Yeah, perfect. I love yeah. it. So uh, in Idaho, I had 10 uh, laborers meet me on the site. They were scheduled to show up at 1 p.m. They showed up 10 minutes early. And by 1.01, we uh, delivered a 2,000-pound, almost 13-foot sculpture up these big landscaping steps into my customer's home, strategically placed in one spot and leveraged up and positioned to mark spots on the floor. And they were driving away within uh, 15 minutes. And you, yeah. you were just sitting there like, what's next? Yeah. Oh, wait, I have to go home now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that's really awesome that we'll obviously jump more into, one of the things that your business has grown around, among other things, has been this 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 river, this concept of the river, the river yeah. table. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. When I decided to become uh, an artist for a living, my aspiration was always to do do my own designs create work that didn't start on Pinterest, didn't start in a catalog, didn't start in someone else's brain, but started in my brain. And so I had a lot of, you couldn't call them failures along the way, making pieces that didn't necessarily sell or weren't popular, but created a new design back, uh, I don't know, a number of years ago around rivers and lakes and oceans and using uh, live edge wood and hand cut glass and it became my river collection and nowadays you could ask almost anyone on the street anywhere in america have you seen a table that looks like there's a river going through it and almost everyone you ask will say yes i have that's pretty crazy that's that started in my shop so started in your brain started in my brain it started all as an experiment like the other ones will this work i don't know yeah so i just have to make it and find out i'm super excited to talk with you hear your story one of the things you just said when you introduced yourself that resonates a lot with me is you introduced yourself as a husband and a father first. Yeah. I'm excited to talk because I just became a father and that's a, that's very relevant to me. Wow. So, and Congrats. there are a lot of people out there that are balancing their life and their business and their dreams mm -hmm. and all of these things. So I'm really excited to share your story and talk from that perspective. Right on. Yeah. That, uh, your priorities get tested when you have a business yeah. and there's demands on your time and opportunities come up. And so just about every week you're you're making decisions that affect your family. You know, will you say yes to that job that just came that needs to be completed soon? If you do, will it take you away from your primary role as a husband and father? So I love it. Yeah, it's an important, important thing to think about. I am a creator. 
I think first and foremost, I've learned this about myself. I have to always be creating something to really feel alive. If, if the weekend comes and I, I usually, I don't work Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and I, for years I would not create something on those days and I just felt like this emptiness. So I started, uh, doing things in the kitchen, baking, cooking, creating things at home, uh, going out with my kids to the shop and just making things that, you know, we came up with on the spot. And so I always need to be creating things. So the way I do that professionally is I'm a furniture maker. I'm an artist. I work with wood and glass and metal and I create my own designs and I do it on commission. I do it speculatively. I ship my work all around the world. Before being an artist and being a creative person, I'm a husband and father, and that's where my true joy lies is in in uh, those relationships and what we've created in our home. Yeah, and that resonates like we just talked about with me very much with the two month old baby and I'm learning the boundaries and the balance and what's important really fast. Yeah. And so there's, it seems like this like flow chart of create the creativity side of you, the, the which is the the majority it's the part that yeah. needs to create but then there's this other part of, of providing for your family because that is the most important part of your life being a husband and a, and a father right mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about the beginning of this greg claus and furniture adventure the story of me becoming a woodworker began when i was in college getting a biblical studies degree so I was studying theology and uh, it was a four year degree. And between the third and fourth year, my my uh, best friend and I got married, my wife, Barb. I took a year off before I finished my degree and we were in Canada going to college. You're probably wondering how this has to do with woodworking, but I, I would go across the border because I couldn't work in Canada as a student there. So I had to work in the US. I would come across the border to Linden, Washington and I worked at a door manufacturing company and my job was recycling wood. And so at the time we were newly married, didn't have much furniture. So I thought I'm gonna take some of these door parts and wood scraps home. So I, I actually bought a ski rack for the top of my uh, 1994 Toyota Corolla, which had about 300,000 miles on it. Great car. I had yeah. one of those too. Yeah. Fantastic. Didn't have a roof mileage. rack. So yours, yours was a little bit more upgraded than mine was. Yes. Yeah. I really missed the yeah. fuel economy on that thing. Yeah. And so I would take wood bits and scraps and door parts on the top of my Toyota through the international border crossing from the US back into Canada where we lived and I made furniture on our back porch. Uh, just real crude stuff, but it fulfilled a purpose and and it became a hobby and my hobby quickly became a passion and I read every book in the library about woodworking and fine woodworking and I aspired to learn more and I decided after later graduating with my Bible degree and floundering and not sure what to do with my life, I thought, I want to see where I can go with this woodworking, you know, because I was so passionate about it. Like I, I couldn't stop reading about it. I couldn't stop learning more it's and more. It's a good sign, right? Yeah, it's important to follow your passion. And so um, that led me to a fine woodworking school that was started by this uh, Swedish furniture master who had written several books that were kind of cult favorite books among like people who were super into fine woodworking. And he started a woodworking school in California. So I, I tried to get in that school. At first, I didn't succeed seed. My work wasn't good enough. Tried it again the next year, got in. And then eventually that led me to two years there. And part of that time I studied in Sweden as well, um, in this little village on an island in Sweden at a, at a craft school there. You didn't, you didn't make it in the first time. Yeah. And then the second time you made it in, was there ever a shadow of a doubt that you were going to go back the next year and try again? No, it was really, really discouraging to be rejected. You know, we all think we all experience that sometimes it's a terrible feeling, but, um, I didn't hesitate to start planning for the next year. Sometimes if you're just relentless enough and you don't give up, you end up achieving your dreams just through showing up and not giving up. So I, I think so often we want immediate success with whatever new thing we try that if we don't get it, we're quick to give up. Yeah. After many years of owning my own business and, and being an entrepreneur of sorts, um, I've learned that the greatest single attribute you can have after talent is grit, just continuing to go again and again towards your dreams in, in spite of your bumps in the road and your failures and your your rejections. So yeah, I got back into the woodworking school the next year and I started as the least talented woodworker there by far. A little chip on your shoulder? Yeah, absolutely. Wood, wood reference. Yeah, there. it was a wood chip on my shoulder. A wood chip you on mean. your shoulder. Yeah, that was my journey into woodworking. And then the moment my two years of like learning fine woodworking was over at the school, we had a we had 15,000 in student debt, which we worked so hard to avoid through all of my my schooling, six years of college from theology and woodworking, worked so hard. But that last year, we needed a little extra help. So we got student student loans. And so started my business with 15 grand in student loans, 
I had a brand new baby who was uh, four months old and had that Toyota Corolla and had some hand tools. Yeah. And that's how I started my business in 2008. Did you think about that 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 was your situation or did you say, all right, what's my first step? You're not experiencing self-pity. You have to view everything through the lens of optimism when you start a business. Mm -hmm. Everything has to seem like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I can do this. Mm -hmm. You can't have that doubt going through your head. You just have to go forward with optimism. And I also had some naivete, yeah. I would say a good dose of that thinking yeah. I was really going to make it work and well, I was going to crush it. Bliss. Yeah. yeah. Knowing what you know now, do you look back on it and go, knowing this and how difficult that was, I mean, would you do it any differently or would you have like, would you know exactly how to do it again if you had to start over? I don't think there's anything I could have done differently. My options were to jump in to the deep end, which is starting your own business uh, as a single income family with no savings and no safety net besides the Corolla, no safety net. And, uh, the other option was to keep working like a minimum wage job. And in our world, you can't, you can't like create a pile of money saved up from working minimum wage. We always had the cheapest place to live. We always had the cheapest car. We had the cheapest grocery bill and we still couldn't seem to save money. You know, it's yeah, a problem. Yeah. So, uh, no, I wouldn't have done it any differently. The hungrier are you, the harder you work. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone was there as my safety net or I had a, spouse who was working and making a bunch of money that would have been a blessing in a lot of ways because it would have covered our needs but i would have uh would have dampened the fire that i had yeah. in my belly to make a success out of it i think we need external motivators to do our best work sometimes you know it's hard to always just find the motivation within to get up work hard push it to the extra level i think we need sometimes things like poverty or outside forces that are are a challenge, you know, to overcome. I think sometimes we need those external factors to really motivate us. Some pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's flip back really quickly to you're in college and you made a decision to get your degree in theology. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different degrees and it's a very in, in, interesting, intriguing. Yeah. What was your you know, part of your decision making process in in deciding to major in theology? Yeah, I wanted to study the Bible and learn more about it. I grew up in a, a home of the Christian faith. And um, there was a, a sacred view of the Bible in my house. And uh, I just left high school with a few different desires. One, to study the Bible, and maybe even more so just to leave home and get away from the family farm in California. The place I landed in, and found was also a place I could I could afford to pay the first semester's tuition on my own. Where were you from in California and, and where did you land for school? I grew up right in the middle, both north and south, east and west of California. It's called the San Joaquin Valley. It's mm -hmm. kind of where all of our fruit comes from and vegetables in the U.S. About 90% of it comes from there. And uh, my family grew peaches and plums and nectarines. So that was my childhood working on the farm. Our life was pretty simple when I was a kid. It was work six days a week, week really hard, go to church on Sunday, rest, play catch in the backyard with my dad on Sunday in between his naps because yeah. it was his one day to like, he knew how to shut it off on Sunday. And then Monday morning early came, he was back at it. So, so that was, uh, it was kind of a year round lifestyle that way. Harvest during the summer, but then all winter and spring and fall, it was doing work to prepare for the next year. So. And hoping that the, the, the weather and the season goes smoothly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, didn't, you don't think about that when you're a kid. But yeah, looking back as an adult, those all those factors are, are stresses for farmers. Yeah. But yeah, so when I came to college, that was my desire was to just completely get away from the farm, get away from all that I knew and have a, a grand adventure in this exotic land called Canada. Where's that? Oh, oh, it's up north. Yeah. Yeah. If you drive 20 minutes on I-5. Beyond the wall, like the huge ice wall? Yeah, okay. it's on the other side of you just bring your spikes and you climb up it. And then on the other side, if you can manage avoiding the snowballs, you I've can heard get of like in really safely. friendly people over there that they, yeah, they've tried, they used to be a real big fighting culture. Like everyone would fight everyone for everything. Yeah. And then they were just like, you know what, let's put some parameters around this. So let's condense it. They made the, they made hockey and they made the rink and they're like, this yeah. is where we'll fight. It's, it's the Canadian gladiator yeah. rink. So, okay. I want to flip back forward because you were going to get these doors and you were bringing them back down and you were starting to, mess around and, and kind of find your creative niche niche. I don't know what the word is. I'm not classy enough to know what the word is, but the whole point is you were able to start to like develop your creativity there and really start. Was that the first time that you said, whatever this becomes is something that came from my brain. Is that where that whole mentality came from? 
Nope. At that point, all I, I didn't realize it was an artistic expression. I realized that we needed a bed and I needed to build one. You built your we, bed out of doors. Yeah. Nice. Like, I did. Later, when we moved from Canada to the US, I brought that bed with us. And eventually, we were going to move again to California later. And so we sold it. I think I sold it for $40 at a garage sale. I thought you were going to say it's in the Claussen Museum now. No, no, no. That one didn't make the cut. Yeah. Um, yeah when I first started woodworking, it wasn't it wasn't an artistic endeavor endeavor. It was rather a pragmatic endeavor. I need a bed, so I'm gonna build one. Yeah. Later I realized, whoa, actually this can be an art form. I can thoughtfully create this. I can put my own ideas into it. I can even sketch a design that's never existed and then I can make that. And it's uh it's functional art. And we just talked a little bit about like having it originate in your brain. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about the first thing besides the bed, the bed was obviously very functional, but ultimately down the road, this first more creative when you started diving into the creativity side of it and mm -hmm. creating from your own brain, because bed, beds have been built before, but yeah. then there was the first piece that you made that was your, like 100% created in your brain. What was that? What was that process like? I would say the first piece that matches that description of like really coming from my brain, really being original, one of a kind was the first uh, furniture project I made it my, uh, Fine woodworking program in California. It was called the Mendo Bench, and it was inspired by the dramatic waves that crash against the shoreline in Northern California. It's this really rugged landscape. And so I really pushed myself to come up with something that kind of captured that movement and feeling. And so I thought I did well on that with uh, my Mendo Bench. And it's what it is, is it's a it's just a uh, like a two person bench with a curving seat and you look at it and you're like oh that's cool and then you look closer and you realize how did how is that seat and solid wood curving in an s curve and it's tapering in thickness as it goes and so i created the design and then i figured out how to build it and so the way to do that was building my own hand planes that hand shaped these uh this profile into the wood and so that was my first successful design that later went on to be in different books and and win some woodworking competitions and and is that in the Claussen museum no that one's not that yeah. one's Oh, it is. It's in his entryway. Wow. I, I made the original, which we own, and then I made about six more. And, and I'm so. going to keep referring to the Claussen Museum for those that are listening. Uh, can you just give a brief description of what the Claussen Museum is? Sure. I've got this amazing customer named Pete. And Pete found me several years ago, and he, he bought his first piece from me, and then he bought another and then another and another. And then he decided he was going to build a home across from the ski hill in uh, Sun Valley, Idaho. And he decided he was going to like do built-ins in his home, one in particular, just to showcase some of my art. And he was going to later commission a large sculpture in this in his entryway for my art. And then it just kept evolving and evolving. And I did more and more work for Pete until uh, we went to visit him uh, two springs ago. And we rolled up, me and my family, in our motorhome. And he came to the front door and said, welcome to the Greg Claussen Museum. And he welcomed us in. And I had forgotten how much stuff I'd made for him because it happened over years. And I came in and just my work's in like, it almost feels like it's in every room of his house. Yeah. And so that's the museum. And uh, it's pretty awesome. One of the things that I'm always curious about, especially with an art form mm -hmm. that is also a business, is determining worth you know how important that piece is to you and what inspired you to to create it and to produce it or whatever whatever the you know the next step is mm -hmm. but then there's this whole concept of okay i need to make a living this is how much time it takes me to do this like just down to the nuts and bolts of business how did you as a like new entrepreneur start to figure this out was it like just crash course uh this this number doesn't work i need to charge this or was there a this is what i believe this is worth and then people just paid it i mean what's how does that work? Yeah, if you simplify pricing down to one statement, the value of an object is what people are willing to pay for it, period. That's the simplest explanation. The way I went about figuring out what people were willing to pay was these arts festivals all around the country. And I did that for several years, maybe six or seven years. And there are these weekend events in different cities urban places like San Francisco and Chicago and New York, and then some smaller places like Palm Springs and Park City, Utah, and mm -hmm. so on. I'd create my own designs. I'd travel there with my family, my wife and our kids. I'd set up a booth. I'd fill it with my furniture and my art, you know, a little 10 foot by 10 foot, sometimes 10 by 20 if I was feeling, you know, yeah. like I really wanted to go big. You put prices on things and people come and you hope to sell to them. More often than not, you don't sell but you're optimistic and you think the next show is going to be the one where you really sell. 
But what you do there is you put prices on your work and you put your work out in front of the public and you get feedback. Nowadays, with so many businesses being internet based entirely, they don't have that benefit of like seeing how a person reacts, right. seeing all the pieces of your work that are actually getting ignored and the ones that are getting attention, seeing how people pick up a, a price tag and seeing how they react, seeing who's willing to get out the checkbook. Yeah. Which we also don't do anymore or now the credit card. Metaphorically. Pull Meta the metaphorically yeah, yeah, pull yeah, out the checkbook. So I, I think there's so much value in a physical in-person element to um, a retail business. Okay. So a retail business is anyone selling an object. It's important to be have an online presence. But if you are exclusively online and you never get to benefit from those in-person reactions, you're really missing out. You don't, you don't build a relationship like yeah. you with Pete, right? Exactly. I am curious. So you're, you're getting ready to go on these, to these different, these events, right? Mm -hmm. And you're the one that's picking your pieces, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to bring this one. This is one of my favorites. I think mm -hmm. this is some, a lot of it's speculative at that point, right? All of it. All of it's speculative. And then you go there and you see people's reactions. And this is like, there's a, with business, there's a non-emotional element to it where it's just like, this is just business. But then there's, there is emotion and passion that goes into art. So you put all your, your brainchild, right? Yeah. And someone reacts. What, what were those reactions like when someone like lit up when they saw something versus when someone just said, no, hmm, yeah. another piece. Yeah, that's a good question. And I remember vividly um, how people reacted to my work because when you're an artist, everything's totally personal because it's a, an extension of you and an expression of your heart and your ideas. And you like pour yourself like ridiculous amount of man hours into each piece you make when you're creating stuff by hand. And so what I do remember is that um, I got a, a mix of reactions, a lot of appreciation, a lot of congratulations on my work. And then there was a big tide change when I brought my first river table to arts festivals. Um, I remember the very first one I brought it to, it was in Salem, Oregon, and uh, it was in a park. I remember people said, would look at it and they were just like mes mesmerized. And they said, hold on, I'll be right back. I gotta go grab my friend. Yeah. So they would go grab their friend and bring him over. And that started happening repeatedly. People started getting out their phones and taking pictures of it, which they hadn't done of my other work. They were like, I got to take a picture of this so that I remember that I saw this here or I can send it to a friend. It even went so far as I had people coming into my art show booth, seeing my river table, and they'd start talking about their memories of like fishing with their dad or stuff like that. And it was, it was kind of like a got emotional for these people. Yeah. I even had someone in my art show booth start crying as they told me a story. And uh, it was all brought on by my work. Like who's going to cry over a dining table? But it's it's the emotion and the memory that it taps into that makes it um, such a neat moment. So I really picked up on that. And I saw the way people reacted to that. So when you're an artist, you're always listening to that stuff. And so I want to make pieces that I'm excited to make and people are excited to uh, enjoy. Where I can overlap those two things with the, their willingness to purchase them, that's like the nexus of like artistic success in my mind. It's mm. like I'm passionate about making it. It's an original design. They're passionate about experiencing it and they're willing to pay for it. And so, yeah, I found that through through these in-person shows. And so I don't do that anymore. And so I really miss that. But I did take a lot away from it. All of that completely makes sense to me, the nexus. I love the nexus. And there's nexuses in many different industries, right? Mm -hmm. um, but especially in the art world. That, that makes so much sense. Now, I guess I'm curious, what are the pieces that you didn't like making, but people loved? I know the river table is obviously awesome. And there's other pieces that I've seen on your website and on social media that are just awesome. Were there some that where you, where you felt pulled away from the nexus where somebody was like, I want this thing. And you're like, I hate that thing. Yeah. I'll make that thing. Uh, I used to make this, uh, this cutting board that looked like a leaf. I had three different leaves I'd make and it was two contrasting woods and it would be this curving tapering stem going through the leaf and it became the handle of, and it was just a cutting board. And I started selling them for like $40. And then, you know, when I really worked up to it, I sold them for 75 and I would make those in batch of like 15 to 20 and just that repetition just kind of sucked the life out of Numbed me it. Yeah. yeah but that's how i paid the bills for a while mm -hmm. at my art shows i'd sometimes bring like all of my big furniture pieces and and stuff on the wall and i'd basically sell nine cutting boards and you know close up shop and go to the next town i did that and i haven't made one of those for like 10 years they're really cool. They're very distinctive. They're, they were my design. And uh, I still actually enjoy making cutting boards. They're a great use of my remnant pieces off mm -hmm. of my tables, the offcuts. So I do that often before the holidays so people can 
buy Christmas gifts at a reasonable price. Let's go back to like the business side of things. What's fascinating to me is the people that understand how to figure out I'm good at this and I'm not good at this in terms of running a business are the ones that I've seen be successful. Like I can't do that again, or I need to do this for this period of time, or I need to sell cutting boards for now. And I need to do this period then I can, or this piece, but then I can hire this out at some point. Tell me about how your brain works in the evolution of the business side when you said, okay, people like this. People are crying over my river table. They're crying a river on my river table. <laughs> the business part starts happening where people are making orders. They're getting out their checkbooks. They're ma- you go, okay, I got to make another river table or another cutting board or, or whatever it is. That's in the business, but then there's the on the business piece. So tell me a little bit more about like, how did you separate your brain from, this is what I love to do. This is my favorite type of art. This is what people love. And then going, I need to run a profitable business to support my family. Yeah, I'm I'm a purist. So I did my very best to never let money and I this is my this is the way I see all of life. Don't let money make your decisions for you. You make your decisions and then you figure out the money part. That's easy to say and it's harder to do. Mm-hmm. I figured out how to run my business on the fly just by doing it. Obviously, I didn't take business classes. I was a woodworker with artistic tendencies who wanted to create a business so I could keep doing what I loved and get paid for it. But then I had to become a student in a business. I quickly, quickly learned that it was all about marketing. There were more talented woodworkers than me at woodworking school. They were all around me. And I can count on one hand how many of like, let's say my 50 classmates ever made some semblance of a living at it. Even if they had, even if they were doing it as a part-time thing, like so many of them, you know, just reverted back to like hobby. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. Not everyone needs to um, aspire to the same goals. Being a hob- hobby woodworker is awesome. Just like I, I enjoy baking bread, but I have no desire to ever make like 20 loaves in a yeah, day. And yeah. like, you know, even if I was just making four loaves every day, I, I wouldn't want to do that. I just want to do it in my kitchen yeah. and eat it with my family while it's hot with a great deal of butter. Yeah. A little bit of bread, a lot of butter. It's a tricky thing. You got to you gotta have a lot of really important skills to be both an, a one-man artist studio and a business owner, gosh, like I'm doing everything from sweeping my shop to uh, maintaining my website, to posting to social media, to designing new work and trying to think about a class that I want to teach in the near future. And how am I going to ship my table next week so it gets to this yacht in Florida on time later this month? (laughs) You know, it sounds funny, but like I'm doing all those things. And meanwhile, like I've got a little boat that can't be outside otherwise it's gonna like the pipes are gonna freeze in it so my whole shop is taken up currently by my boat (laughs) like it's just like this weird thing how do you stay on top of all that that's a lot to think about yeah my mind always feels like it's pretty full yeah it's hard too because i'm a i'm a real detail guy i'm a small picture kind of person i don't always think big picture but i have to force myself to learn how to do that and practice that and so i'd be remiss if i didn't mention the value of my wife in my day-to-day work because I'm always bouncing ideas off of her. She's a homeschool mom, which means 15, 12 and nine year olds. My wife's educating them and taking them all over the county for ninja class, cello, tap dance, musical theater, uh, soccer, you know, all this different stuff. Meanwhile, I'm interrupting her when she's right in the middle of like teaching math. And I'm saying, Hey, what do you think about this design? Is this any good? Mm-hmm. Is there anything I should change on it? Hey, um, do we pay our estimated tax payment? You know, so she's like always there fielding my ideas. Oh, and like, I'm going to this podcast this afternoon. Yeah. Is there any really things that are really important you think I should say? Like yeah. big picture, you know, she's always, she's always my counterbalance because yeah. uh, she's really bright and can think about a lot of things that I don't think of and fills in the gaps that I miss. And so she's a very important part of the picture and while, while we're on the topic of my lovely wife, I would also add that if someone's going to start a business and especially one that is not like designed around profit, but more designed around passion, like an artist is or someone doing their passion project and wants to make a career out of it, having a completely awesome, supportive spouse is uh, unquestionably the most valuable thing you can go into your business with, you know, in addition to your, your skill. Wind. Yeah. In addition to your skill and grit that we mentioned earlier. So if your spouse isn't on your side and in your corner and hundred percent supportive, then you've got a whole different uh, thing going on. It's a detriment. I imagine. It sounds like she's more big picture, like the way that she thinks she can see a bigger picture and you're yeah. more small picture. Exactly. Detail. Yep. 
Tell me about that. Like in a partnership, like how like you are running the business together because you're bouncing ideas off her, right? She, yeah. She's seen that big picture. Does it feel like there's a void that's filled by having someone that thinks like that? Or is it, do you guys feel the overwhelm of the other, the way the way other person's brain works sometimes? I think we do. And that's the beauty of marriage is uh, where you have weaknesses. Your spouse may have strengths. It's not a guarantee, you know, yeah. that's where discernment and choosing your spouse is important. And, uh, but when that works that way, where your, your spouse is strong, where you're weak and vice versa, it's a, it's a beautiful part of a relationship and it makes you indispensable to each other and super important to each other. You look to each other when you have a need or we have a question or, and also when I make really heavy tables, I call her and say, can you please come get the other end? Like, <laughs> it's not just a metaphor that she carries the other end of the board. She literally does. Yeah. Yeah. You need another yeah, person. Yeah. And she's strong. So I'm thankful for that too. Good. Okay. Let's flip to river table. You're providing for your family and you're also starting to get this momentum and get this, like people are noticing what you're doing and you're starting to get notoriety around the world and around the country. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that we've met each other, but the humility that I can sense from you as a person, as a business owner is like awesome. And it's so cool to see very successful people that have that mm. sense of humility. Tell me a little bit more about that balance between the providing for the family, like the feather in the hat co conversation we had and starting to see these like this recognition on a big, big level. Yeah. The crazy thing when you're an artist is you just want to be left alone to create. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're trying to make a living at it, you have to like get up on the top of a chair and yell to the world. Hey, look over here. Look at what I'm making. Does anyone want to buy it? Would you please buy it? Please, please, please buy it. So it's this weird thing. And a lot of people can't make that leap. They're like, no, I just want to continue to be left alone to make my thing. And that's okay. Like we were saying, that's okay if that's what you want to do. But uh, it's a necessary evil, if you want to call it that, that you have to promote yourself and you have to market yourself. And so there has to be some vanity in play. You know, like my business is my name. You know, if I get my business printed on some merchandise, I'm literally wearing my name on my chest. Like yeah. that's that's a little odd and yeah. a little vain. If you want your friends to wear a t-shirt, you're asking them to wear a t-shirt with your name on it. So you, you better know? make it a comfortable t-shirt. I know it's yeah. got to be comfortable yeah. and it's got to be stylish. Breathable probably yeah, in breathable. the summer. Yeah. yeah. Stretchy. Potentially. Stretchy. Yeah. yeah. When my work took off, it was a, it happened at a distinct moment, a distinct day, and I remember it vividly. It was July 1st, 2014, and I had been taking classes in marketing, both locally, like at the technical college, I think it was, or Whatcom Community College, on uh, writing press releases and introducing yourself to the media. Is that something that you're just naturally comfortable with, or is that something that was outside of your comfort zone? Yeah, I think of myself as an introvert, but when I when I go to in person events or whatever, all of a sudden I realize I can talk and yeah. like I can socialize with people. I guess you develop this idea of yourself when you work alone all day and there's no one else around, and I'm not talking to anybody. Occasionally, I'll like have an awkward conversation with my dog. Yeah. You know, if he's in the shop, oh, I talk to my dog, and it's so one sided that you're like, what am I doing? Yeah, why am I? Why are you Stop the only being person? A yes, man. Say yeah. no. Tell me yeah. it's a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. Come Assert on. Yourself. Pull your weight here. Yeah. yeah. When you're when you're in that situation, you forget that you can actually have people skills and stuff. So I enjoy talking about my work because I'm excited about it. We all want to talk more about the things that excite us most. Mm. So that's kind of cool. Like my business is built around what I love doing. And so it's easy to talk about it. When I talk about my successes in my heart, I'm giving God the glory for all of my success. And so while I may not be black and white talking about it in my heart, that's where it's coming from. So I'm I'm giving praise to, to God for all, all of the good things that have happened and thankful for all the, the challenges that have shaped me as a person too, you know, because they're character shaping when you have uh, failures and, and uh, rejections. To the question of uh, self-promotion and, and getting my work recognized and how that fits with myself as a family man and trying to remain, remain humble and all of that, my number one priority is uh, trying to be who God created me to be, and that's as a creator. So in my mind, that's how I'm made in his image is I need to create things the way he needed to create the world and every rich little detail that surrounds us everywhere we go every day. And so that's what I love to do is to create. And um, in addition to that, my I would say following that up, um, my responsibilities to my wife and kids to provide for them and then 
you know, third would be, you know, being an artist and making a success of my business. So I kind of put it in that order. Back to marketing, I was I was um, taking classes on how to write press releases, how to basically get the attention of people who could write about me and promote me. And we're talking like blogs or magazines or yeah, all of the or, all of the above because yeah, yeah. you take whatever you can get yeah. when you're desperate. Yeah. And I was desperate, you know. From 2008, the year I started my business, up until July 1st, 2014, when I went viral, um, we were living on food stamps and we lived below the poverty line. I was the sole provider for my family and still am. My that's been a priority for us that my wife not work that she be at home with our mm -hmm. kids full time. It's a wild job and it's way harder than what I do. Boy, does it take skills and then layer on top of that homeschooling. It's it's not for the faint of heart. It's a big no. deal. I mean, she's raising up the next generation in our family. She's shaping their hearts. She's teaching them Spanish. We were living below the poverty line for a number of years. All the while, I was trying to figure out how can I get my work noticed. And so what I thought to do was like, I got to get into magazines. You know, my work's just like I'm making it in this little shop in this little garage in Linden and no one knows about it. When people see it in person, they're all excited. But then I come back to my shop and no one sees it. I don't have a store. You know, my arts festivals were for these little three day, three day windows in summer. And then the rest of the year, I was just an anonymous artist. Mm -hmm. Like I got to get recognized. How do you do that? Well, you have to create something that's worth writing about if you're the fourth fifth tenth guy to do something you're not an you're not newsworthy you're not a story that someone wants to write you need to have a compelling story to share and so uh through experimentation and and playing in my shop i created my river table design and then i grew it into a collection of both various sizes of tables and also wall hung art pieces and i built a website around that i had it all professionally photographed by some great photographers had it on my site started trying out social media and that was kind of like the foundation that i laid before I went out and then promoted myself through the press releases and email introductions. And did you know what, like, did you have specific, like, I know there's, there's platforms like social media and magazines. And did you like have specific magazines or specific avenues of social media that you had learned in class or just what you had seen work really well? Yeah. Or your line of work. Facebook was around then, but Instagram wasn't really a thing yet. And no uh, MySpace. No, no, I, I, I kind of just skipped that one. Yeah, good call. So I was thinking just in terms of print at the mm. time. I targeted magazines, I, the Linden Tribune. Yeah. I introduced myself to them. They came out, you know, wrote a big front page story on me a couple different times. Tried to get into the Bellingham Herald. Then I started like Lifestyle Magazine, Sunset Magazine. They wrote about me. Then I thought bigger, like, okay, how about online uh, stuff? Or first, like, I would go do a show in New York City, so I would send press releases to all the New York uh, newspapers and designers. Like I would collect all of these email addresses. Often, I don't know if they were even real, or sometimes I'd even like create one. Like I would just like type editor at newyorktimes.com and then just like include that in my big yeah. email blast. If you focus too much on the the Mailchimp statistics about who opens it and who doesn't, yeah. it's really discouraging because yeah. it's like yeah. a. <laughs> It's like a three to 6% open rate, but all you're hoping is for one or two home runs and then build momentum off of that. Anyways, so fast forward to where that really worked out for me. I, I sent an email introduction to this really cool design blog that I follow. It's called uh, Colossal. It's a thisiscolossal.com. And I just thought, man, this is the coolest collection of art and design that this guy is curating. It would just be really neat if I was part of that, if yeah. they wrote about me. I sent him a quick email. He wrote me back a short time later that same day. Oh, I love your work. I'll, I'll post about it in the morning. And like he said he would do, he posted about it in the morning. Uh, his name's Christopher Jobson. And he wrote about it. The craziest thing happened. It was like going into a dry forest that hadn't seen rain. And someone lit a match thinking that one tree might burn, but the whole forest just went on fire. That was me going viral. Like he wrote about me and then everyone that reads his blog wrote about me. And then everyone that reads each of those blogs wrote about me and it blew up into this exponential thing. And I was getting requests within the week. People were buying, pieces. people were buying my work. People were asking if they could order and commission things. Magazines were asking if uh, they could write stories about me. Blogs everywhere were writing stories about me. I was all over Facebook. All of a sudden, friends of friends were mentioning to my friends, hey, have you seen these new tables that's got a river in them? They're like, yeah, that's my friend Greg. Yeah. Where did you see it? Oh, on Facebook. And yeah. then it just blew up and it was the craziest thing. And so within two years of going viral, I had sold out of my entire inventory, which was actually pretty big. I should have told a story about a year earlier when I went to a show in New York City, spent all of our money, 
sold nothing, no orders, mm. fancy, fancy show, all the big wigs there, sponsored by Architectural Digest, big expensive event, like crazy expensive. I sold nothing there, but after I go viral, shortly after that, everyone bought everything I brought there. We are at the brink of like collapse. We had hardly anything left. We spent it all on that show. And so fast forward, going viral, sold all this work, all these commissions. And within a short time, I had a not just a one-year waiting list for my work, but a two-year waiting list for my work. People were sending me deposits on commissions that they would then wait 24 months to get. It filled me like with this attitude that I was just like the coolest guy ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just like, I can't believe it. Like I just, in my head, my chest was just always out. Like, I can't believe it. This is beyond my wildest dreams. I didn't even think that was possible. And so, and it just kept escalating for years. And I'm still kind of in a wave of momentum from that. I haven't really done marketing since 2014. People just find me, they buy my work, they commission my work. And um, I've I've done work for all corners of the globe. I've sent it to small little islands in the Indian Ocean, giant tables and huge crates that went on freighter ships. And other ones I put on airplanes and it goes Is across the world. a table or a boat? Like what's happening yeah. out there? Yeah. <laughs> and then I, then I, what I like to add too is like my customers aren't always just like people with lots of resources who are just getting something they don't need. That's that's a piece of it. But a lot of people have they'll email me and say, hey, we've actually been saving up for a table of yours for two years that's and special. we're finally ready to buy it. And it's like, whoa, that's so cool. And so sometimes customers send me pictures of like their kids doing homework you know, homeschooling their kids and they're doing math around the river tail or rivers going through the middle and there's just like calculator and pencils and pens. And it's really neat. My customers are like from everywhere and do everything. It's not just one category. That's so, so powerful to, to see that and hear that from people like, hey, we finally hit that point. We're ready for a table. Yeah, yeah, it's super exciting. So why why river? Why did you why did you pick river? What's is there is there something is there a, a metaphor to it? Is it just what worked well with the table? Like sometimes it's a simple answer, right? What drew you to that concept? Well, I had sort of a serendipitous moment where I had for years been working with dimensional lumber as a woodworker, which means just straight boards. And the serendipitous moment was meeting a local retired dairy farmer who's since become one of my close friends. His name's Howie. He lives, he, cheers to Howie. Yeah, yeah. cheers to Howie. Yeah. Anyways, the why meeting Howie was a big deal was because his barn was full of these boards that he'd cut after hours. He'd milk cows all day, he'd work like 16 hours. And then as a hobby, That's after it. that, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's slacker. He needs to get his act together. Yeah, come on, dig deep, Howie. Come on, man. Yeah. He would mill logs like his, as his after work therapy. Mm -hmm. And he filled up a barn with all of these slabs. And what was cool was a, a term a lot of people know, now know nowadays because it's become real popular and trendy is live edge, live edge, which is live edge, live edge, live edge, live edge. Live edge. So when he cut the wood, he kept that part of the tree on the wood. And it's sometimes it's a, it's a slow sweeping curving edge. Other times it's like a, this crazy bumpy edge. But anyways, when I first saw that, I thought, wait, this is part of the tree. I thought wood was just like straight pieces. Round. Yeah, round yeah. and straight. Round and straight. Yeah. That's all I'd ever seen. Literally, I was unaware of this. Yeah. Around the time I met him, I, I learned about live edges and I was just completely taken with the beauty and the shapes and how no two pieces are ever the same. Like sand on the seashore, like when you look at it under a microscope, it's astonishing. No two of those little grains is the same. Six feet above the ground, looking down at the sand, you're like, oh, all the sand's the same. You look at it close, you're like, holy cow, everything was made with like incredible detail here. We just confirmed that you are in fact a detail guy. <laughs> I just was enamored with live edge wood. And um, so the river tables were born out of playing with the live edges. And uh, I was really taken by how when you turn the live edges from the outside to the inside, it created a negative space that reminded me of canyons and Whoa. river valleys. And another serendipitous thing was I had just learned right at that time, someone told me about how you could cut glass into different shapes mm. and also how glass could be different colors. So I experimented with a, what about a blue glass? What about it's it's cut in a unique shape? What if the shape was complementary to these crazy edges? What if I put it in there? Holy cow, that looks like a river. What if I ran with this? Oh, what if that void and that that other piece over there became a crater lake? And you ran it by your wife numerous times, of course, right? Actually, I did. Yeah. 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 And when my wife gets excited and really tells me a design is good, I know it's good because yeah. she doesn't say that flippantly. She's not just patting my back. She's like, she's looking to help me out. So that was pretty neat. Um, discover how I discovered that 
and then I just played with it and experimented with it. And um, I grew it into a collection. And like I was saying, I, I, I did this big fancy design show in New York City and people loved it, but they didn't buy it. And I thought, what? How am I going to recover from this? This is like a colossal fail. Like yeah. this is this is confirmation that this is not going to work. Yeah, I really had to reflect on that. And sh I had to ship stuff all the way from Washington State to New York City. It got shipped back. Some of it arrived broken, which was like a kick in the butt yeah. that I didn't need. It was really, really a tough time of like, okay, where do I go from here? And they're back to grit. I just stuck with it, stuck with it. Because you like doing it. I like doing it. Yeah. And what else am I going to do? It's not like I have some sweet fallback. Where it's like, yeah. oh, yeah. well, the furniture didn't work out. I'm gonna, yeah, it would have been like get some lame job that doesn't satisfy my soul. And I think the one thing that like we were we're all dying to know: two different elements, wood and glass. How did you take these two things that don't like? I I wouldn't even know where to start how, on how to put them together and mm -hmm. make them stick together. I'm not as much of a detail guy as you are. Yeah, obviously. How did you do that? That's science. Mm. That's crazy. I think uh, when you're just a student of your craft, you just incrementally gain knowledge. You just incrementally add new tools to your tool belt, to use that metaphor. You add skills and eventually over time you you say, what if I tried this? I think that could work. I'm doing that now in my shop too. I've got a new series of pieces I'm working that that I'm working on that combine brass and wood. And it's like, well, I think this will work. What if I try this? Yeah. And it doesn't always. Yeah. And then you learn from that and you keep going and you try something new and then yeah, one one thing that uh, took me a little too long to learn was that there's no rules. I went to a woodworking school where they really said there were rules, mm. like this is the right way. You know, it's a whole lot of right ways, and I had to unlearn that. It took me several years. I, I kept all the amazing skills I learned there, but I had to really ditch that attitude or that mindset of there's a right way to do everything. Every surface needs to be hand planed with like a razor sharp hand plane, yeah, so that it's like cut rather than abraded with mm. sandpaper you know it's like a really high level purist attitude like we make our own tools we sharp sharpen them so sharp that it'll cut the hair off your arm and then we never use live edges you know we always do things this way that way whatever was it the tipping point right there but like when you said you saw a live edge and we're like this is amazing and then but you had that voice ringing in your head saying I, no live edges allowed no, I think that voice was there for sure. And I had to overcome that. But like with anything, you know, when sometimes the house you're raised in, you're, you're, you get these limitations embedded into your brain mm. that you spend your adulthood overcoming. This was just a smaller version of that, you know, where I had to overcome my, my education in a way to think outside of that. Cause so much of like doing something original is training yourself to think outside the box and try things that may not work. You have the sounding board in your own mind of, Hey, this is a reminder that there are no rules, but when you're working by yourself, I, I know you're running stuff by your wife and you have this amazing sounding board of like, when she gets excited, it's a really good idea. When she pokes holes in it, it's an improving idea. But like, how do you know, like, how do you just know to keep pushing forward? Like what's, what's the guide for you to keep pushing forward on something when there's no one saying, I mean, now that you have more people that are aware of your brand, whether it's through social media, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and through the notoriety, through the, the forest fire of mm -hmm. growth, you know, how do you tell yourself, like, I'm gonna keep doing this, like, or or I should stop doing this, or, you know, there's no one, there's no one there besides you and your wife to say, this is a good idea or not a good idea. I've long ago developed a stubbornness around doing, only creating work I'm excited about. If I start something and I'm in my mind, I start thinking I'm gonna do something and then I, I really think it through. I'm like, I'm not just not that excited about it. Or that's going to be like a production mentality where I've got to create multiples of the same thing. I just don't do it. I only do everything gets filtered through that uh, way of thinking. Like I have to be excited about it in order to do it. So, um, but I'm at a unique point now kind of going in a little bit different direction, slightly off your question where I've had like this two year waiting list. I've had my work go viral. I've had my work imitated by countless people, mm. people all around the wood world uh woodworkers who are making a living off of cr recreating my designs which is trademarked right yeah 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 and uh imitating it or you know adding their twist to it or whatever and and selling it and so now i'm at a unique spot where right now i'm actually working on the last two commissions that i have on my books after that i have no orders no commissions no guaranteed income for the foreseeable future Maybe cutting boards, <laughs> maybe cutting boards, yeah. but as crazy as that sounds, I'm actually super excited about it. And I feel a sense of freedom. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm untethered to 
try new things, spend my day doing things that I've wanted to do, ideas that I've had in, in the back of my mind that I want to bring out and, you know, have them become objects. So I'm super excited about it. And also it's super scary. It's like, okay, how many months can this go on? Mm. Yeah, it's kind it's of a unique, before. it's worked before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you create something, there's, let's say three categories and they kind of blend. The first person goes, this is amazing. I want to buy it and I want to enjoy it only from this person. This is the person that does it, the Pete's of the world, right? Uh -huh. Which there aren't very many. There's, there is only one Pete. Then there's the person on the other side that goes, this is a great idea. I want to duplicate it and see how I can make it cheaper and blah, 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 mm -hmm. down the line. I want to put my own twist on it. And then there's the people in the middle, right? Let me ask you this. As a person, as an artist, as a business owner, what's your mentality on? Is is it a compliment? Is it frustrating? Or like what 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 type of feelings do you feel when someone when you see something pop up that is your creation that came from your brain? Mm -hmm. True artists who are aspiring aspiring to do original work, they're not the people copying my work. The people copying my work are some other category. They're not artists. There's a there's a code among people who are aspiring to create original work that you don't take someone else's work and then present it as your own. So that that's just like a code among artists. Mm. At least I think it is. Yeah. It's not like I've been at some meeting where we talked about our codes and regulations, yeah. but I'm pretty sure if you think about an author, right? Yeah. An author, there's a code that you don't plagiarize. Right. I, I, I think of artists as, as no different than that. Mm. And so when I see it, how do I feel? It feels gross. It feels really gross to to see that because yeah, it's it's taking food off of my family's table, mm. you know, and that that doesn't feel nice. I've always had the mentality that my my work stands on its own, and I'd happily put my work up against anyone who's imitating my work, any of my work, any of my pieces. Put it side by side and let the people decide which one they're drawn to. I'm happy to do that. I don't feel threatened as an artist in that way. Um, do I feel threatened like as a business? Of course. I mean, that's like the worst thing. I had both the best thing happen to you going viral, yeah. all that success, all those sales and the worst thing, countless people stealing my work, creating a whole like trend around it. And then now when people Google a river table and like want to buy one, they're not going to do like a 24 hour deep dive where they read about who started it. They're just going to be like, oh, that's oh, the first one. thing I saw. Oh, they follow, ship follow, yeah. ship, buy, you know? Yeah. And so what that equates to is those people are selling their their imitations. And I'm over here with the other side of it where I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how to keep selling my work. But when people find my work, they become like passionate advocates. Yeah. Like Pete tells everybody about my work. My other customers are starting to come back to me for the second, third, fourth time. Mm. And I've had customers become collectors and that's the ultimate endorsement. I've bought your work. It costs a lot. I loved it so much. I want more and I want to pay you again so I can have more of it. Or I want to come back to you for a commission and I trust you to create something awesome for me. Here's some loose parameters. Go, yeah. go with it. Like that's the ultimate. I have no lack of confidence in my, in my skills and where I stand as an artist. Um, I've just, I've dealt with an unfortunate situation with all of the imitations and you know it's constantly testing me and requiring that i lean on my faith and and also check my heart and and forgive the people who've used it to to hurt me and my business and family and stuff like that so well i'll just be straight up there is only one river table it's said here right now to those that are listening yes i will stand on i'll stand on the mountain and say there's only one river table appreciate that and um we we, we support you on that yeah. And because it's your creation from your brain on the flip side, let's talk a little bit about social media. The, the thing that can be used for good and the thing that can be used for evil, right? Yeah. You've amassed an amazing following that are here or on other parts of the, the planet that say, this is amazing. I don't know exactly where I found this. Maybe mm -hmm. they found it in a magazine. Maybe they found it on this platform, that platform. Maybe they met you in person, but people are watching what you're doing. 90, hundred thousand people on Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people that, uh, that, that follow your work. Tell me a little bit more about how you started to embrace the whole social media side of the business. Yeah, I was, I was a little late to the game on, on Instagram, but when I finally joined, um, all the growth is just completely organic. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't post based on like, how can I get more followers? You know, I don't follow trends and you know, I haven't jumped on the latest trend of doing reels too much. And I don't, I don't think in the, I don't think like, how can I post in a way that's going to get the most engagement? I just want to share my work. I want to share my story. 
one of my missions is to inspire people with how I treat my wife and kids and how I create my work and how I run my business. I want to be a bright light to people. And so social media is cool for that reason, because uh, it lets people see behind the scenes and get an honest look behind the curtain of what my life is like as an artist and father and husband. So I think that's really cool. So you have to kind of take the good with the bad. Mm. I wish social media wasn't a part of my life or a part of my business, but somehow it's wedged its way in and become a very important part. And so I'd love to find a way to inch my way out of that. So we'll see. I don't have any grand strategy on how to do that. And I don't know how serious I am about actually doing it, but I guess some people call it a necessary evil. It's tricky. It's a lot of, it's, it's, so many things to so many people. It can be so unhealthy and it can also be great. Like for me, it costs no money and I can share my work and have tens of thousands of people see it. And how amazing is that for a business? But then if you take it too far and it becomes too important to you, it becomes a, a negative in your life and you start to really care about the numbers and you start to care about the comments and then you get negative comments and then you're blocking people. And then you have this whole drama going around in your head and you're asking your wife, what should I do now? about the social media post. And it's almost not, it, it's real, but it's not real. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's real, but it's not real. So it's tricky. We're all learning together on how to do it and how to be healthy when we do it. Yeah, it's good to talk about, I guess, so that we can learn from each other, but. So somebody comes up to you on the street and they say, hey, I'm thinking about following my passion and starting a business, or I, I'm an artist and here's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of advice can you give to somebody in that position that when when you're driving around the Toyota Camry with the roof rack that's in that position that's excited about something what's your what's the one bit of advice that you could give that person so this person is an artist wanting to be an artist and, yep. and open their own business artist or a business owner because you're both I think the question is a little different for each person for an artist I'd say well for both I'd say I'd give advice that I was given when I was at a, a pivotal moment by a business mentor he surprised me and he said you need to figure out what your mission, personal mission statement is. And that seems so cliche and it's the sort of thing we do in college. We write out our mission statement. Actually, it's incredibly important because with social media, it sweeps you along its current and takes you to a place you didn't anticipate going. Or even life, you know, life will sweep you along. And um, if you're not sure of what your why is for why you do what you do and what your purpose is in both your business and your life, you're going to let things take you in all these different directions. You're going to end up places you never thought you'd be. And so I think it's really important whether you're an artist entrepreneur or you're just a business entrepreneur to start there. If you're an artist, you want to start with what, what are you most excited to create? You want to develop your skills and become the best at your artistic talents that you can be, but also it's a 50, 50 game. I think it's 50% artistic talent and 50% business skills. And so you don't want to uh, neglect one or the other. I don't know what I would say to someone who's starting just a entrepreneurial endeavor. I think, uh, yeah, in that situation, just make sure your business expresses your values, I think, mm. and what's what's most important to you, because we spend a lot of our days working. So that's your life. What you do all day is your life. When you get home, that's your life too. But in our culture, your work is the biggest part. So choose wisely what you're going to spend your days doing. Super powerful. I love the simplicity of it. And well, we've done a couple things. We've talked about the true river table, which yes. is there's only one. We've uh, drank a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of coffee. I appreciate you coming in here and, and sharing your story. It's, it has so many twists and turns, right? It has so many ups and it has so many learning parts, right? And so I really appreciate you being willing to sit down, share a glass of good whiskey, yeah. And it's tasty, huh? It is good. Yeah. You're a bourbon guy? I am. Yeah. I don't discriminate though. Yeah. You accept all. I'm very receptive of, of the scotch as well. Scotch. Yeah. yeah. This is just a shout out to when you buy a river table, <laughs> also buy Greg a bottle of scotch. He'll take a bottle of scotch or bourbon. I would love that. Or you could share one. The next person to do that is, is going to be the first and I will receive it with open legendary. arms. Legendary. You are yes. legendary. We know it's going to happen. So again, there's only one river table and I love your mentality on that. And for those of you that are listening on this, if you're not already following Greg on social media, the, the necessary evil, go take a look at some of the really amazing art that he's done. There's some cabinets that you did that were just like completely mind blowing. I showed my wife and she's like, but those are cabinets. And I said, yeah, those are cabinets. And she's like, it's the most, it's like, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So please keep, like, keep bringing your light to this community and also to 
other entrepreneurs and other artists out there because the way that you look at it is super inspiring. So cool. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failure, and mindset with entrepreneurs right here in Whatcom County, Washington. You can be the first to hear about upcoming guests by subscribing to the Building Bellingham Facebook or Instagram pages, as well as the Building Bellingham YouTube channel. This episode was produced and edited by Tiffany Holden. Our videography is done by Cooper Hansley. Community projects are by Taylor Beal. To learn more about the team behind the podcast and to download our media kit, check out our website at www.livebellinghamnow.com or search Cohen Group NW on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or LinkedIn. From the whole Building Bellingham podcast team, thank you for listening.